Hello, welcome, lovely to have you here. Um, today we're presenting your lecture. This lecture is going to be presented for the first time by Professor Dr. Walker Trimble, and he's going to talk to us about the AI and what the use of AI is for the future. So please welcome Walker Trimble. We can imagine the kinds of things that open up and the opportunities that open up as a result of a technology. Then we can we must realize that these techniques. Uh, opportunities must be open-ended. No one realized when they built a theater for cinema what would what would lead. It was a huge investment, uh, uh, an enormous uh, uh, experiment to make some a place where someone would only go and watch uh, something that had already been filmed. People that aren't weren't even uh, present on the stage, and uh, I think that that's why this is a this is an important in this ruin. It's an important thing to think about. Uh, what will this technology destroy? Uh, what will it create? And what sorts of affordances, that's a term we're going to look at today, and opportunities will it create that yet haven't been uh, seen and encountered? So uh, I think we, uh, as a translator, someone who worked as a translator for many years and still, still does work as a translator, I've already in, we've already encountered what uh, corpus linguistics and and uh, artificial intelligence in its very primitive stages can, can do. Uh, a lot of us started translating using uh, uh, Trados and other kinds of programs that help translators uh, some 15 years ago. And you notice the more you work with it, the better it gets, just like Google Translate, right? So Google Translate uh, came up with a lot of nonsense early on. Now in English, it's very good. You try another language that's not what perhaps, perhaps Kaza, and it still comes with a lot of silliness because the corpus is much smaller, right? And uh, so as, as translators and people who translate things back and forth for a living, you, uh, we've already encountered this, what it means to contribute to that which might undermine your own uh, existence, right? The more that you, you translate, the more and the more that you correct the translations that are given by the computer, the better it gets and the less it needs you to be the intermediary. Uh, and so we, we kind of already have this, this tension in our experience. And uh, it's also important to consider the extent to which what, what these technologies are that you heard about this morning, uh, <clears throat> chat GPI and others, uh, to the extent they are about words and language, and the extent that when you read what's been produced by a computer, that you are supplying half of the meaning yourself. Right? Whenever we read a text, at least half of the meaning in the text, and if it's poetry, sometimes two-thirds, or sometimes perhaps 70, 80 percent of the meaning that you read in a text, you supply as the reader. And so it's a bit of a fudge to give somebody a text, right? So we say, let's show you a picture that has been made, a painting that's been made by AI, but our interpretive apparatus is there for a painting. So the only really useful thing we can say this contributes is if it's interesting for an art, an element of artificial intelligence to read its own text. And for some reason, nobody really cares about that. Nobody cares about the fact that you might, uh, that it might be producing a text for me to read. But no one thinks about, beside me, there might be another computer that's reading that text too and might get something out. What can, what if, uh, we're concerned that it's going to replace writers, but what if they replace readers? And what if it replaces, we're concerned that it will be, create, be creating music, but what if it creates listeners? And what does it mean for you to have, would be to have an AI bot standing next to you in a gallery uh, looking at a piece of art? For that, that doesn't concern us. I think that's part of our problem, is that we're much more concerned about what it means to be an author and be replaced as authors what it means to be replaced as or sharing with other participants in creating meaning. And so I think language is fooling us here. Language is putting more into it than it already is. And that's part of the, part of the subject. Uh, a, another, another important thing that's also based on language is the extent to which we attribute, uh, we have attributed consciousness already to these elements, and the extent that we've undermined our understanding of our own consciousness. Way back in the 1930s, 
uh, Marshall Heidegger, in his, in his lectures on the fundamentals of metaphysics, said that the problem with Cartesianism, the problem with Descartes' way of thinking, I am, I think, therefore I am, is that it made existence, it made thinking and being into uh, only rationality, only rational processes. And it ignored our physical, physical process of our being as being part of what it means to exist. This is also, I think, another issue. So language as a foil for rationality and will as a foil for consciousness. These things put together create a problem, not just with how we understand what an other, what a different being might be as it speaks consciously to us, but also what it means for us, the way in which we understand ourselves and how our own understanding of ourselves has in some sense lost the values that it should have, and even is, I think, inaccurate. So, I want to put on some. I'm going to put on something here that's just will run in the black background, and you can. I'll talk about it later. I want to start off with an illustration, a famous, uh, actually a rather unfamous illustration, a very famous set of texts. There's a, a whole genre of Buddhist texts. The most magnificent part of these tropes is that each of these stories is preparation for incarnations of the Buddha. The Buddha becomes, goes from one incarnation to the next incarnation, and each time he improves, each time his soul becomes better, it goes into the next incarnation, and it goes through again and again and again and again as he goes through his life as a bodhisattva, someone who's given up their right to go on to heaven uh, uh, as a part of their own compassion. So this, this is in Islamic literature. This is gone, it's gone into Christian uh, ascetic literature. It's, a, it's an extremely common trope. One of these Jataka stories is about a king who uh, lived a magnificent court, and someone gave him a courtesan, a, um, a huri who, is, uh, who was incredibly beautiful, elegant and graceful in her movements, and he fell in love with her. He became fascinated by her, and he wanted to spend all of his time with her. And he delicately got her into the boudoir, and as soon as he embraced her, she fell apart into a thousand bits of ropes and sinews and mechanical operations. She turns out she was a robot. In fact, there were lots of robots. But there's lots, there are lots of evidence of robots in the ancient world, in Greece and in ancient India. Their names for them even. And uh, but this story is one that he looks at this machine that's lying. He says, "This is the." object that I desired, that I loved. This is the thing that I was willing to give my life to, and yet it's nothing but a pile of leather and ropes and guts. And he says the same, and he thinks the same, this is the moment of himself. How then, if this is just a conglomeration of bits and pieces, why, how is it, is it that I am not a conglomeration of merely bones and blood and guts and shit. How is this the case? Not for me. And this revelation causes him to leave the palace and go off and become an ascetic and therefore get ready for his next incarnation on the way to be the Buddha. And so this story, I think, is very, is, it gets at the main problem that we face aesthetically both, and less philosophically, but mostly in, in emotionally to this issue of AI. There's a sense of horror to it. There's a sense of the uncanny. There's a sense that this, this thing that is speaking to me is not alive, and that's disturbing. And it comes from a number of, of sources. It's the fact that it's unbounded, right? It, it's, not it's not collected into an individual. It's the fact that it has, there's no end to its capacity, that it can continually produce things and make things. It's, a, it's, a, it's like a, a, some sort of a mass machine that you would have seen in science fiction. Can, that a mass consciousness, a swarm-like consciousness that doesn't have any fixed position. All of these things lead to a certain feeling of the uncanny. And the uncanny is often related, as Freud said in his famous essay, to that which is not quite alive and not quite dead. No wonder that we have all of these computer games associated with zombies. Right? The zombie is a, this seems to be a major feature of popular culture when we have this tension between what can, is alive and what is dead. But a big, a big problem with this is also that when we 
encounter these things. Again, this is something that is speaking to us. And we would like to attribute to it a certain kind of uh, conscious response, just because that's part of what communication is. And we don't know if we're getting it. So again, we come back to the point. What's the difference between me receiving something from AI and me having it next to me also receiving information? That is in part why this is so disturbing. Because every time we engage in an act of communication, we have presumptions about the personhood of this thing that we're talking to, that is talking to us, even more so than when we're talking to it. And so the, the tension of the, of, of the level of existence is an important one. The second part is that this was a king. He was in a palace. He could have, uh, he could have, just, he could have had as many courtesans as he could afford. Why does he, why was he so concerned that this thing turned out to be a machine? It, why could he not take his pleasure just as he would from anything else? And why did the, dis, the, the, the disillusion of this machine cause a tension and a rupture in his own understanding of himself? And uh, perhaps it's, and it's because this is of course a, a story about how we don't have any, anything permanent about us. And so it may just well be that some of the tension that we have here is because not, we don't really trust in our own humanity. We've lost a bit in the, of the confidence in our own humanity. And that is less sensitive. The element of us losing our jobs is one that always comes up. But looking over it and, and looking through these, um, I think that is, that's a political aspect to this, which uh, certainly deserves consideration, the, the fact that, for example, in, the, in ancient India, no one would have dreamed to say, well, this is just technology, we just have to accept it. It's, it's progress, it's going to come whether, we, whether you like it or not, you have to accept it. Uh, not even a beggar in the streets of the, of the Nepali town where this king lived would have thought that you had to accept technology just because it was there. So there's an ideological element to this. There's a political and ideological element, which is, which is saying that that this is a dominant, domineering form of value that goes beyond any other human value. And of course, that's determined by, by the people. It's no, it's, it should be very suspicious to us that the people who, uh, who have democratized information and the democratization of information has led to the richest men that the world has ever seen. Right? That we have an incredible conglomeration of power and wealth in something which is meant to be democratic, as opposed to be democratic, which means it's probably not that democratic. That's a different issue. I'm not going to get into the politics. It's very important, and it's, and it's uh, no less important. And it's at least a third of this tension that we see here. But I don't think it's the root, at the root of the tension. So the root of the tension, I think, comes back to, again, what it, to three things. Uh, what it is that we're talking to in this conversation that we're having. Secondly, what it tells us about ourselves. And then thirdly, what it tells us about desire. Because that was the thing that was what drew the king to this mannequin, was a form of desire. And the desire that, that he, not only desire, a desire that he was looking for recognition of himself. Not a desire that consumes, but a desire that shares. And uh, I think that it's in this, this last point that we, where we can see some movement forward. Now, what happened that gave us this notion of consciousness that is, in a sense, that has turned us into something of a machine? Well, Heidegger, as I said, uh, said that it was Descartes. Uh, along with Descartes, uh, and from the aspects of not just Cartesian philosophy, but also in anthropology, the how, how Descartes conceived of what made the human being, but also his understanding of mathematics, and that everything could be turned into a mathematical description. Uh, it would be impossible to have AI now without the development in logic and uh, computer science and informatics that we had, and cybernetics, that we've had over the last 150 years. It would be impossible. And uh, philosophy has played a major role in this. And so when Rudolf Carnap said that science is for understanding the world, 
and philosophy is for understanding language. That movement of philosophy uh, toward language, the so-called linguistic turn, was something that made all of this fundamentally possible. But it, it moved against another form, as I said at the beginning, another form of understanding life and another form of philosophy that uh, considered it also as important, the, in, the explanation and the understanding of what it is to be and to do in the world. And so the, how did this movement toward language and toward logic turn us into these kinds of machines? Well, a major step was made in 1958 when um, Noam Chomsky wrote a famous, sorry, maybe 1959, uh, wrote a famous article, uh, a famous review of a, of a book by uh, E.F. Skinner, where Chomsky said, basically, the behavioral understanding, understanding language as an organism, is nonsense. It can't tell you anything. By understanding, uh, understanding humans the way that they, you understand giving rewards to rats or cats or birds is no way to understand how verbal forms emerge, how um, how syntax comes about. You need to have some other form. And this is considered to be a founding element in cognitive science. Chomsky at the end of the, of the review says, we need to draw together psychology, linguistics, um, uh, cybernetics, and uh, any other, and philosophy, and to come up with an understanding of, uh, of cognition that will give, set the ground for psychology when we understand the brain well enough to do it. And uh, the problem is, is that now, 60 years later, Chomsky is still going, and we haven't found the uh, language center in the brain that is going to explain everything. It's much more complicated than that. So it, it, this approach may not correspond, may not give us what we want, and it may be doing something else. Uh, Eleanor Gibson, the great child psychologist, said in, uh, in an article uh, way back in the 1980s that she thought that the uh, Cartesian approach to understanding, the, sorry, the, the Chomsky approach to understanding uh, cognition had a problem. Uh, she said, uh, the cognitive revolution had something to do with the reappearance of the old dualism battle, influenced primarily by non-psychologists, such as Chomsky and Fodor who have urged a Cartesian philosophy and consequent psychology on psychologists working on problems of language, perception, and conceptual thinking. The way the world is perceived must derive from preordained, derive from preordained rules and concepts, an analog of Descartes' innate ideas, that serve as premises for inferences about it. And so uh, following her, I've turned this view uh, crypto-Cartesianism. Crypto-Cartesianism means that you take, you believe that the, a particular uh, logical analog in the brain. And so I don't need to look at uh, the brain, and I don't look, need to look at what it is for an organism to act and communicate with the world. I look at the structure of language, and that structure is going to be represented in some way in the brain, and the parallel is going to be analogous. The philosophical parallel to this was... Um, Jerry Fodor's language of thought hypothesis, right? So language of thought hypothesis, that the, the thought is structured like a language. If you actually follow his arguments through, you see that it's much more modest than that, and that it's not. But this is the way he phrases it. And this analogy then is put together as some sort of a, a calc, one related to the other. What this then does is this allows us to say that you have a computer operating in your brain. Basically, you have a logical mechanism, a logical uh, apparatus operating in your brain, and that that colonizes the brain, very much in the way that the soul of Descartes operated and did rationality, apparat, reason, reason, reasoning, and, uh, and will. And uh, this allows you to get beyond any sort of gap of between the mind-body, because this simply, it's encoded. So when we hear things like language is encoded in the brain, uh, morality is an illusion, a collective illusion of the genes. We're, we're taking things that are in the world of language and inserting them back into biology. And this is, I think, very problematic because you can spend 60 years uh, looking at the structure 
of logic and language and <clears throat> not step into a laboratory at all and think that you're understanding. And simply say, well, it's part of networks, it's a, some system that we have yet to explain. And uh, the, the problem is not so much that science doesn't need to study linguistics, doesn't need to study, well, of course it does. The, the problem is the way that you, that you frame this as a solution to the problem of, ex understa of understanding what it means to think, what it means to be reasonable, and what it means to act. And that's the problem. The, the, and so then we come up, we have created for ourselves a model which resembles a computer. No, by no accident. From the, from the very beginning of, of John von Neumann in the 1950s, they used, they looked at neural systems as ways to model computers. Uh, neural interfaces is not, it goes from back to the beginning, not, not recent times. So we've, we've turned ourselves into a kind of mechanism, and therefore we're, we're frightened by some other mechanism that is approaching us. So what we need to then do to, uh, to get beyond, what, what is it that we should do to get beyond this idea that we have simply, we're simply colonized by a logical system in our, in our mind. Well, uh, Gibson, Eleanor Gibson, said that uh, opposed to this view is a modern day empirical one, rooted in biological science, naturalistic, uh, resting on evolutionary and ecological principles. And uh, that seems to be where a lot of the study of consciousness uh, is going. Uh, Carl Friston, who I'll talk about, I hope, at the end of my lecture, uh, probably one of the main, one of the major fig figures in theoretical uh, biology, <clears throat> uh, believes that the 21st century is the century of the, ec of the e ec ecological theories of consciousness, and whereas the 20th century was one of computational theories. And that, and that computational meaning that we're looking at how algorithms work in the brain, and now we can look at how this serves the organism. So one of the major, I think, a, a, a a good element to look at this. Maybe I'll show. It. Maybe I'll show it to you just to, uh, to <coughs> illustrate it. That what then we might need to understand consciousness is not to go from the level of its products we can see in language, because language can be very deceptive, just as it can be very deceptive to have these forms, right, that we see. But to go from the language of what it means to go from the system of what it means to be an organism and go out from what it means to be active and dynamic in the world, what it means to be alive. Because as far as we know, we don't have any signs that are produced by things that aren't alive at some point. And the, the sign can be deceptive, but actually the living thing is where at least we have to have some way in which it can grow into a system that can combine energy together into energy bearing signs or units of some sort. Right? They can store energy and then find some way to expend it. And so, <clears throat> so that's what Gibson was saying. Now, one of their great concepts, the greatest, she had, she had herself one of the most fascinating discoveries, I won't get into it in, in, in child psychology and development psychology, it had to do with perception. But the ecological theory of perception that uh, Eleanor and James Gibson, J.J. Gibson, came to put together in the 1950s to 1970s was about how there is direct perception of things in the world. And his uh, idea, which was his most popular term that became important for ergonomics, for building engineering products for, in philosophy, it became, was, called, was called affordances. And that means that everything that we have and perceive in the world is there not just uh, that we take it as a grid, but we take it, these things as individual objects. And our perception of them is immediate. So whether it's a coffee cup that I grasp like this, or a stick, the stick is made for me to grasp it. And my grasping of the stick is something I can do automatically. But there is a, there is a, the things and our perception of things are in a continuum. That as one comes against the other, the other conforms to it. Uh, this is an excellent example of how, actually in artificial intelligence, how affordances work. The, as far as I know, the, uh, the, um, uh, I have the paper that was used to present this technology did not use the term affordance, but this is essentially what it is. So this is a robot. The robot is programmed uh, without any, uh, there's no programming for the robot's actual functions for the structure. There's no programming for any of these four starfish arms, or four arms. The, the program itself simply has the ability to learn 
to use what is there uh, at its disposal. So when it starts moving, it has programs to move, and it has a program to, when there is a response, then there is a counter response. And over time, the robot learns how to walk uh, without any instruction, right? So you would think you would have a program that would say, okay, this is arm one, arm one lifts up here, arm two then falls, arm three falls, four, and you walk. That's not how this program is designed. The program is designed to learn in interaction. So the program, in my terminology, in Gibson's terminology, builds affordances for the environment around it. One of the things which, which this program has, that's the main, his main contribution, is that the, <clears throat> the robot has a, the program that runs the robot has a sense of its self-existence. That means that, so it has a sense as, and how, what does that mean? That means that it, its, uh, rela it, its relationship to the world is defined by its position in the world, instead of by its position uh, by a, a set of commands. And what they found, this, it's not in this video, is that you damage one of these arms, and over time, the other three will get to move. Because it, otherwise, the program would have been fouled, right? One arm doesn't move, and it keeps trying to move. In this case, over time, it figures out that three of them will, will be able to move. It's redefined its relationship to the world. It's shifted its affordances to go for three arms. And so this is one of, the, one of the ways in which this is designed. So this is a way in which we have an autonomous system that uses its interaction with the world to define itself. But we can look at it here. You can see it flop around. Yeah, like and it, this is just a short video. And they've studied what's fascinating about this. They've studied the process. They've studied the process of how it, uh, it goes about moving. And they've looked at vi different stages. And so again, all these stages, they're autonomous. Right? These stages are, are uh, <clears throat> but they follow a, si a similar set of patterns because, the, because of the laboratory environment and because of the shape of the organism. Just in the sense that our consciousness is shaped by our positions, by the positions of our body. One of the things I noticed in if you start to look at artificial languages, is they're extremely inefficient. Uh, the, uh, it was in the news seven or eight years ago that uh, Facebook had invented a, uh, two bots talking to each other. They could put them in conversation with each other where they could generate their own correspondence, right? It was in the news as being a very scary thing. Again, I think because this shows us that we were, we're, we're not able to, we don't know how to interact with these things. <clears throat> And uh, I got interested, no one, everyone talked about how they had to shut it down because they had to, they were no longer comprehensible to each other. The, uh, the uh, observer couldn't understand what they were saying to each other. And, um, and so I thought I'd look at it and try and understand why, uh, what, what the language was like that they, that they invented for themselves. And they were playing a game. They were playing a bartering, like a betting game. And so they would start off by saying, I give you three, you give me two, I give you two, you give me four. And then they started to say, three, 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 four, 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 to give three, 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 four, four, four. And I realized that it wasn't, it wasn't comprehensible. They knew what they were saying to each other, knew in the sense that they could respond to what they were saying. They'd worked out an, uh, an algorithm for, com for communication, but it was incredibly inefficient. And I remembered an old article by uh, Lieberman in 1974, that said that syntax comes from breath. Because you have a, a certain amount of breath that you can fix, and you have to combine enough semantics in that breath to speak. And I thought, if anyone said that to Chomsky, he would just, he would just walk out of that. Right? That syntax comes from breath. That would be, that's mysticism. We think of that as mysticism, but it's incredibly practical. Because syntax, like everything else, comes from our activity as an organism. And that's an affordance. Syntax, breath, forms an affordance for syntax, right? Four arms and legs forms an affordance for a growing organism. And the, this is, so this is the kind of stuff that AI can teach us about, I think, that's much more interesting. I, 
of the, the corpus work that we see with these generated texts is interesting. But it, to me, it's much, much less interesting than this kind of stuff. Because this kind of stuff gets at a meaning of life that's beyond words, that starts with individual growth, the individual growth of cells. It's much like, much more like the, some of the speculations of Gilles Deleuze in, the, in, the, in 1980, who right, you know, thought that we would, culture would eventually become rhizomic, that we would all grow like roots. It's much closer to that, but instead of creating some sort of incomprehensible postmodern kind of explanation for it that, we, that was supposed to be also somewhat communist, it's actually something that you can actually see how it works. You can experiment with how it works you can, and see how it does it. This set that's been running in the background <clears throat> is one of the fundamental parts of artificial life. Now, this artificial life is a way of, of making experimental code that that can imitate the way li living behavior, interactions, life and death, reproduction, predation, and see how it works in a, uh, in a uh, computer setting. And I think that this is really where we, uh, where we need to look and, and see where things go. After all, life has certain structures, right? 18th and 19th century science have been involved with giving us names for these structures concepts and terms for these structures. But language may not be the best way to do it. We might need some other forms. And because anyone who's studied organic chemistry knows, the names for things are far less meaningful, more meaningful than how they fit together. Uh, a diagram, a schema of a biological process is much more effective than a paragraph of text. And so this way of not just visualizing for us in this very kind of interesting and beautiful way, and way that notice it, it feels like it feels like cheese growing. It has a, like a sort of a, a slightly icky sense to it. It's a little bit disgusting and disturbing, almost like the like looking opening up the uh, mechanical portison. But they have many other it has many other things, and there are many been many results from this that would be uh, that are not as often not near often as discussed as these fearful things like Facebook language but are actually far more important. One of them, for example, in 2017 was Mark, no, Mark Novak's, actually from 2010, Five Rules of Cooperation. Using artificial intelligence systems, they discovered that <clears throat> morality, we can account for morality in systems that are complex. And this was picked up by the Harvard theologian, of all people, Sarah Copley, and they have an entire volume, I, I translated it into Russian, uh, uh, about how the relationship between sacrifice and the theology of sacrifice and game theory. And uh, so morals, along with these affordances, come conceptions of harmony, of uh, symmetry, of growth, flourishing, what it means to grow, what that means. These systems are, are very fascinating because they are based on, uh, on th basically three principles. You have an understanding of a certain space, a tile, they're called um, cellular automata. So they, you, you create a little tile structure, and the decision that one moves, either on or off, is in relationship to whatever number of tiles are around it. And then you create that rule, the algorithm. So uh, if I've got three green tiles or three ons or three scissors as opposed to rock, paper, scissors, that's one common one, then I, I am a rock. If I, there are two, then I'm a scissors. If there's one, then I'm paper. And based on that, you get these structures. But what's interesting is there's a very small number of them that actually don't cascade off. If you notice these, there are some that will go flying off in one direction. Probably you've all noticed that. They're flying off in one direction, and they'll go off in one direction, and, and they kind of disappear. And if you have a, a rigid system, all of a sudden, all of this will become green, or it'll all become black. They're all, they'll all follow an extremely orderly pattern, which means they're not growing, or they'll all die. And so it takes actually three or four, this I think might be rule 30 of Conway's rules. Of, uh, so there's a, a rule 30 that is very good for building very complex systems that don't repeat. With this, we understand how the genet genetics of growth works. You think, when you look at a leaf, that the DNA, that leaf, has an analogous, just like Cartesian analogous in, an analogy in the brain, that there's a picture of that leaf in the DNA of a tree. But that's not how it works. 
very simple rules of cellular growth, very simple rules, uh, are able to determine a great deal of complexity. And this is this is something more that we that we can something much more valuable than we can see than some sort of external threat. And so, what is it then that we can make of understanding the way that these systems work and coming up with not just mathematical theory but also ethical, artistic systems? We've lived now with for at least three centuries of separating what what should be from what is, of saying that science is about describing what things are, and religion and ethics and art are about just saying what's true and beautiful and good. But these systems can explain how it is that something is harmonious. Many of these models, as they work themselves out, they turn out to be golden sections. That are, goes back to what we understand of beauty from Greek geometry. And so the, the, the way in which uh, uh, living systems flourish, and even the understanding of flourish, the understanding of what it means to grow and to live and to develop, is something that's part of this. And so I think I can see that we're, we need to move on to some discussion. So I think that I'll, I'll, I'll finish with one, I'll go on with one final point. Huh? And, uh, uh, and uh, uh, this, is, this comes from uh, Carl Fristin. We turn to briefly Carl Fristin. He has probably one of the most productive models of, of, uh, um, that uses artificial intelligence and looks at a number of things from the processing of light in the retina to uh, the emergence of possibly very fairly good uh, uh, evidence for the emergence of schizophrenia uh, to the way systems grow and to the way, art, to the way uh, even non-living systems develop into living systems based on these kinds of bases where you've got a certain area of, of application and predictions that you make about this area. Each of these relies on also on probability, right? So you, you're able to make a more complex system by thinking that, well, what's the future going to be? And as living organisms, you build up energy and, uh, and then assess how that energy is going to be expended. I've written a paper about how this applies to creativity, how we can look at the process of creativity not as something that creates something out of nothing, not from a kind of deistic sort of understanding, but as one that is the creative process where you, where you engage, where you are active, then you rest, and then you have an insight as being, as being representative of some of these systems. And that, that we may have a better way of understanding what artificial intelligence can tell us about beauty, and about activity, and about creativity. Then, uh, then from things that can tell us about the expansion of our knowledge or our, or our capacities uh, to reason. And so I think that that's where we need to then return to what, what this challenge offers us. Does it offer us an ability to say that we're merely going to serve these things or whether we're going to have some sort of opportunity to, to, to say, what does this give us, how does this give an opportunity to grow, to flourish? How does a, 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 the understanding of life at this level, at a cellular level, and the way and understanding not through concepts but also about through through uh, form and growth and form, uh, gives us the ability then to uh, to progress in and do things that humans, which and to redefine what it means to be a human in progress, which means to move up, to to move beyond where we are now, to something high and to something great. What flourishing means in its best sense, what it meant to Aristotle and what it meant to the Buddha, right? To, to, to transcend where the state that you're in now, an asundered state that you are now, to one that might be beyond yourself. And I think that's why the, where we see perhaps the greatest risk. I'm not so much afraid of AI taking over jobs as I'm afraid that we, our own patterns of thinking, turn us to idiots. That uh, when you uh, write a text, for example, and someone says that, well, this text, this text doesn't look like what I've seen before. Or when people spend their lives online and end up repeating the same things to each other. When children don't have the textures of the world that inform their affordances and the variety of experiences that they can have. 
but simply uh, allow them to process things that have already been made for them? Are you not imitating a, an artificial intelligence yourself? And should you then not be surprised when it can do better at it than you can? So uh, we should consider as part of our progress what it means then to flourish and to live and to be active in the world. And that the, the variety of surfaces like all these that we have around us are things that inform and give us a certain uniqueness that, uh, that allows us to put all these extraordinary things together. And so uh, in the end, I think the risk is that we follow these paths and these patterns to such an extent that they are that they give extraordinary limits to the way that we can expand ourselves. And in that case, we, have, we should be afraid. So long as we're willing, we view that our goal is something beyond ourselves, I think then there's no risk. Thank you.